psychologists at the BTO, and I'm going to be chairing today's sessions. During our conference sessions, your cameras will be switched off, so we won't be able to see you, Then there'll be no chat box, but there is a Q&A function though, where you can submit your questions, and please do put these in as you go through, don't need to wait till the end of the talks. Whether you're a regular conference attendee, or this is your first time, a very warm welcome to you, and thank you for coming. We have three fantastic talks all lined up, and there'll be time for questions at the end of each talk, so as I mentioned, please do get your questions in as you think of them. Um, the Q&A function will be at the bottom of your screen, and even if you don't have a question yourself, do take a look at the Q&A box, because you spot any good questions, you can actually give them a thumbs up to give them a higher prominence so they have a chance of being asked, as I'll be selecting questions from there. If you have a question of a more general nature about the BTO, the best opportunity to be asked these will be during the AGM on Saturday. So we are providing 11 free talks this week, as well as our AGM. These are only possible due to the support of, the support of BTO members. So a huge thanks to all of the BTO members that are on the call today. Income from memberships and donations make up almost half of our charity's total income. And without your support, the BTO wouldn't be what it is today. Thank you very much. If you are in a position to make an extra donation to support our work, we'd be extraordinarily grateful. And you can do that via our special conference link, bto.org forward slash support. Our members are our lifeblood, and it's through our membership support that we can inspire and inform and make a difference to our birds. If you're not a member already and you enjoy today's talk and feel like the BTO is an organisation you'd like to support, please do consider joining us. That all being said, we'd like to jump straight into our first talk now, which will be presented by Anthony Wetherill. He's going to be telling us about his fascinating research on tracking goose sanders in Scotland and beyond. And so I will take it over to Anthony. Hello. Uh, sorry about that. Just getting everything set up. Hi, my name is Anthony Weatherhill. I'm a research officer at BTO Scotland. I'm coming to you from uh, lovely Rosyth in Fife today. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, tagging and tracking of goose on, gooseanders in Scotland and beyond. Um, this is work which uh, myself and uh, colleagues John Calladine and Gary Cluley have been working on uh, over the past two years um, and has yielded some really interesting results so far. Um, so just a bit of a background into, oops, sorry, I'm, oh, can't move the screen. <laughs> there we go. Uh, into goosanders. Uh, if you're unaware, goosanders are a, a, a fish eating species of duck. Uh, that uh, arrived in uh, colonised Scotland in the late 1800s uh, from Scandinavia as a result of uh, this thought, as a result of uh, improvements to um, the condition of many rivers and so a proliferation of fish that, that was available. Uh, so the population uh, arrived there, along with red-breasted mergander around the same time as well. Over the past 40 years, there's been a 149% increase in uh, goosander uh, in the goosander population in the UK. They've, from their initial colonisation of Scotland, they spread to Northern England and Wales as well, though they're not quite as common in Ireland. Um, the, I should say that whilst there has been an overall increase over the past 40 years, there has been a slight decrease in recent years. Now, why were we tracking goosanders? I mean, it's they're, they're, they're clearly not a conservation issue if they're increasing uh, so much uh, and they've, they've been quite successful. Well, the real uh, conservation uh, issue uh, is actually this, it's salmon, which over the same period of the 40 years has decreased uh, by uh, 40%. Now, goosanders eat fish and they do eat salmon as well, and that has brought them into conflict with um, uh, salmon fisheries, particularly in Scotland, where the salmon fishing industry uh, is worth quite a lot to the Scottish economy. As a result of that, there's been a lot of interest in the uh, the potential impact that um, goosanders might have on salmon. Um, BTO has been involved in two reviews so uh, so far uh, into what the potential impacts of uh, goosanders on salmon are, and so far 
we, there's been inconclusive. We haven't really been able to say that goosanders actually do have an impact on salmon populations in Scotland. What we do know about salmon is that uh, one of the drivers of their uh, decline is at sea survival. So if, as, as many of you will know, the salmon are a migratory fish uh, that uh, breed in fresh waters, but head out to sea uh, to mature. Um, and the main point of uh, contention in the salmon life cycle where goosanders are concerned is during the smolt run. This is where fish, uh, young fish start to develop the um, saltwater adaptations and migrate down from uh, the headwaters of rivers uh, to the sea. And uh, this is where they are a particularly good size for goosanders to eat. And it's thought that goosanders have quite an impact on the population of, um, of, of smolts. Uh, by some sections of, of the fishing industry. So uh, as, a, uh, as a first step into trying to understand uh, some more about the goosander um, impact on, the, on salmon during the salmon smolt run, we decided that we would need to, um, to try and tag some of those birds. Now, the difficulty of doing that is that we needed to know how to catch them. And unfortunately, not a, a huge amount of birds are actually caught each year. Most uh, birds that are caught each year are uh, flightless juveniles uh, during the molt. So this is during sort of late summer and autumn. But we were trying to catch them in the spring, which is when the, the salmon smolt run is. And these are fully flighted birds. This is a, a, a map which um, is from Stephen Vickers's Ringing app, which um, shows over the past 10 years the, um, the numbers of birds that are, are ringed in each part of the UK. Um, as you can see, quite a few birds have been ringed down in Wales. These are actually from nest boxes. Um, but overall, it's very low numbers of birds that have been caught. Um, Northumberland is really the, the, the one of the main places where they're caught um, over the past 10, 10 years. But again, these are flightless juveniles. So we uh, arrived at various different, uh, well, we arrived at a method after various trials and errors um, of erecting mist nets um, under bridges in shallow sections of, of, of river in an attempt to catch the birds as they're flying up or downstream. Now, my first attempt at trying to, to do this was uh, with um, a 60 millimeter mesh mist net. And the first pair of birds that flew towards uh, the net flew um, straight through, uh, uh, snapping each of, the, um, each of the shelf strings and leaving goosander sized holes in the net. So after that, I did some modifications to my net, repaired the holes uh, and uh, was much more successful uh, from then. Uh, and in the first year, um, we caught six birds around the River Tweed in the Scottish borders. These are on tributaries of the Tweed, mainly the Gala Water and the Leader Water. This is one of the, the more lovely locations at uh, Leader Foot Bridge on the Leader Water, uh, where we caught quite a few birds um, flying downstream from uh, as they were usually in the afternoon, they'd fly down after feeding in the river uh, and before roosting on the main stem of the River Tweed. Um, I found that straight sections of river were, were uh, much better for catching in as uh, if there were bends in the river, the birds would actually lift um, and go over the height of the net. Bridges tend to keep the birds low to the water. They either fly under the bridge or they fly over it. And if they fly under it, they're generally going to fly into my net. Um, I also found that um, long straight sections, which had uh, a lot of tree cover on each side, which formed an effective tunnel, that would be a surrogate to a bridge. So tagging the birds, um, we the, the license that we have to, to do so um, is a glue to feather mounting technique. This is used for many waterfowl species. Uh, and we were using two varieties of tag, path track and ornitella. These are GPS GSM tags. So they don't need to be retrieved. They're not archival tags. They send the data directly to us. So every four hours, I would get a nice little data download of where the bird had been. 
Uh, and these were recording every 15 minutes where the bird was. Uh, I was initially using gauze uh, between the tag and the feathers uh, to, to ride a bit of a barrier, but um, we upgraded to a thin neoprene as this allowed the tags to actually float when they fell off, um, which would enable me to retrieve the tags. And given that each of these tags is worth about £800, um, it was much better to try and get more use out of them if I could uh, retrieve them. Uh, this bird here has a sock over its, its head. It's it's a clean sock. I haven't knocked it out with a dirty sock or anything like that. Um, this ju just keeps the bird calm whilst the glue is drying. So these were the results from, uh, from the first year of tracking in 2001. Um, we caught six birds on the river, um, on the river Tweed. Um, and as you can see, from the map there, uh, for most of this, uh, the birds, particularly around Gala Shields on the Gala Water there, um, they're just sort of moving up and down uh, the river, uh, not really moving t terribly far. Um, but you can see that there's a bird with this, uh, the sort of light brown uh, dots that moves quite far north up past Lauder. Uh, and this is right up into the Lammermuir Hills, which are um, it's grouse moors, basically. And we, this was a, a female bird and we thought she was nest prospecting. And there's not an awful lot of trees up there. I mean, they are whole nesting birds, but we assumed that she was actually looking for nest sites uh, under heather banks uh, and in holes in uh, the banks to small bones up in the, the heads of the head of the river leader there. Uh, you'll also notice that down uh, at the bottom of that track there, the, the light green uh, dots, there's not very many of them at all. That's a bird that only kept its tag on for about two days. Um, so that gives you an idea about the tag retention that we were having around in, in that year. We were actually using super glue to tag the, uh, the to attach the, uh, the tags, but super glue isn't actually that waterproof. So um, most tags didn't stay on uh, for very long, two weeks at maximum. Uh, in two, 2022, we caught seven birds from the River uh, Tweed and then a further eight birds from the River Devon in Clackmannanshire. Now, I chose that location because it's a bit, bit, a bit closer to the BTO's office, so it wasn't quite a, a, a journey all the way down to uh, the Tweed. Um, these are some, some of the more detailed uh, uh, tracks from 2022. We, we had slightly more su success in tag retention uh, this year because... Uh, the glue that we were using was Araldite, which is epoxy resin. Um, it's a bit more waterproof and stays on for a bit longer. There's, I should highlight there's no ill effects of the, uh, these adhesives on the birds at all. We didn't notice. Uh, I actually retrapped a couple of birds once the tags had fallen off and we, we could find uh, no ill effects, no uh, impact on their weight or condition at all. So it sounds quite horrible putting glue on, but it, it's it's it's. Um, it's fine for them, though we were vigilant uh, to um, any issues. Uh, so this is a female that we caught at Leaderfoot Bridge, uh, that lovely bridge I showed you earlier. And um, as you can see, she moves up and down the Leader Water and spends quite a lot of her time at a nice big bend on the River Tweed where there's quite a lot of fish. Now, unfortunately, there's also a gamekeeper there um, who does shoot the goosanders um, under licence. They are, that's... Uh, uh, a licensable purpose um, in Scotland. And uh, one of my tagged birds was shot at that location, but this particular bird wasn't. Um, at the same time as that bird was tagged, I caught the male of the pair as well. And um, his tracks are slightly different. Um, you can see there uh, to the left that he, for quite a time, he was following the female. Those are more or less the same tracks. He stuck quite close by to her. Uh, but he divorced her after um, a, a week or two and then spent quite a bit of time going up and down the River Tweed around Kelso. Um, and then I'm not sure if you can see on your screens, but far over to the right there, there's one little dot that's out at, at the coast there. Now, he spent one day uh, just to the south of Berwick-upon-Tweed, um, just uh, taking in the sea before flying back to Kelso. Uh, and then I thought, well, what's he going to do next, this bird? Because um, that's quite an interesting movement. He's not, you know, that's quite far from where he was. Well, this is what he did next. He then uh, left Kelso at 3 a.m. Um, in early May 
and eight hours later arrived at the Norwegian coast, uh, which is a distance of 513 miles. Um, what I really like about these tracks, so each one of these dots is every 15 minutes, and you can see as he gets a wee bit closer to this Norwegian coast, he's really getting a bit tired and slowing down. So after he reached the Norwegian coast, he then uh, started heading south uh, towards Bergen, um, visiting from what I could see from aerial photography, um, seemed to be going to places where there were fish farms and uh, possibly um, taking advantage of, of uh, fish numbers around the farms. Once uh, he got to Bergen, he then started heading north again before the tag fell off. Now, previous to this uh, track, um, the malt migration of, of male goosanders from the UK uh, was studied back in the 80s by Bob Furness and Brian Little, who dyed a load of uh, white goosanders, uh, tango orange, uh, and then waited uh, to hear back from bemused birders about uh, bright orange goosanders. Uh, and it was from that study that they found that the the, the location of British uh, male molten goosanders, uh, the location they go to is the far north of Norway. So as far as I know, this is the first time that this has been, this a malt migration has been tracked, but it's a partial malt migration. He's not gone all the way there. So the next question is, well, how does he get all the way to his molting grounds up in the far north of Nor Norway? Does he follow the Norwegian coast north or go around into the Baltic or go straight over Norway? If only I could get the tags to stay on for a little bit longer. Here's some of the tracking results from the uh, River Devon um, in Clackmannanshire. Uh, all the birds were caught at Cambus, which is near um, some uh, lovely bonded warehouses full of whiskey. And uh, this is a female uh, bird that kept her tag on for 15 days. Um, and from these uh, tracks, you can see, really see how they really stick to rivers. They're very linear um, species that uh, don't uh, really go anywhere else other than rivers. I mean, that's something that we didn't know about goosanders, but it's just really nice to see that uh, in, in tracks. This particular bird, much like the birds down in the Tweed, didn't really go very far in the time that it was tracked, mainly stayed on the River Devon and on the River Forth, um, though it also took in uh, the, the, the River Black Devon, which is um, around Clackmannan there. However, some of the birds that we caught at Canvas did have some really, really big uh, movements, which was really interesting to see when compared to the birds on the River Tweed. This, for instance, is a juvenile male that um, flew off west to um, the Ettrick water and to Loch Lomond, before then uh, traveling all the way to Loch Leven at Kinross, uh, where he then spent most of his time. Now that's a non-breeding bird, so it's probably um, moving around looking at different river systems um, and uh, you know, potentially scoping out uh, places for next year. But this is a, an adult male who also had a very, uh, you know, went on on his wonders. Um, so moving uh, up along the A9 there um, and spending some time on the River Tay as well. Um, so there's a big difference in the, the way that birds move on the River Tweed and, and the way that birds move uh, from the River Devon. And it's partly we've got some um, thoughts about why that might be. It's possibly because um, the numbers of fish available in the Devon and in the Tweed are different. I'm not really sure because uh, there aren't really that many studies uh, from the River Devon, but um, the, the uh, fish studies are, are, are quite intensive on the River Tweed. But another key difference is that uh, from the River Devon, as far as we're aware, there are, there's no licensed shooting of goosanders. However, there is licensed shooting uh, on the Tweed and it's, it can be quite intensive as well. Um, in th it's thought that perhaps on the River Tweed birds aren't moving quite so far because um, there's more risk of them getting shot. So uh, what will this work res uh, result in uh, and where are we thinking we might go in the future with, with this? Well, we're, we're hoping to publish a paper um, in the winter, um, this winter, um, which details the, the methods that we use to catch the uh, goosanders and the tracking data um, that, that we collected. We were hoping to be able to compare this with fish tracking data that's been gathered on the River Tweed as well, 
Um, however, the, there are uh, problems in the way that uh, that data is collected that means it's probably not quite so easy as we thought it was going to be to compare. Um, we'd also like to look at um, habitat analysis as well. This is something that's a bit new to me, looking at um, river habitats um, and looking at the, the bits of the rivers where the birds are spending most of the time and what is particular about those bits of river. We're hoping to also expand our tagging efforts. Um, we've got quite a few more tags left to put on, on birds. Um, initially, we had hoped to catch 50 goosanders in one year, but they're very difficult birds to catch, and <laughs> six was quite a lot less. Um, I'll briefly mention that we, we, we we're glue mounting the tags at the moment. We are looking at uh, other methods of long term ta tag attachment. There's a lot of difficulties involved with that. Um, waterfowl don't take very well to harnesses at all. Um, and so there are welfare issues to consider there. We're potentially looking at captive trials uh, of different um, uh, tagging methods. And then we're also interested in uh, tagging red-breasted merganser. Uh, this is a species which is now um, amber listed, much more of a conservation concern, um, and very little is known about their movements at all. Um, I did come very close to catching one male red-breasted merganser at the River Devon. Um, he hit the mist net, was caught, but as I got there, he got out and I wept when he left. Um, this is just a wee video of one uh, of our goosanders being uh, released. And um, this is uh, Mark Wilson, who's my uh, colleague. So there he goes. Uh, and we get some lovely bycatch as well. Uh, Ros is going to talk to you about shell ducks. Uh, but uh, herons, dippers and golden eye have also been ca caught uh, at the same time. So uh, Moran Tang, thank you very much. Um, I'm open to questions now. I'm sorry if I've overrun, um, but uh, yeah, hopefully that's. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Anthony. That's really good to hear. Really nice to hear how it's all going. So we've had a couple of questions in the chat, uh, some of which you've already answered, so we might have to move on to the others. Um, one of the top ones is asking that Norway trip is an average speed of something like 64 miles per hour. Is that yes. unusual? Uh, well, given this is the only bird that's, <laughs> that's been um, tracked, I don't know. Um, it, it seems quite fast, but they they are very fast flying birds. It did have a good tailwind behind it um, for most of the way. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully I can um, get more tracking data of malt migrations um, to see what the different strategies are. I always assumed that if the bird got tired, it could just pitch down on the sea and have a little rest, but um, it did it in a one -er. So um, yeah. Cool. Uh... Thank you for answering that. So our next question that's come in is asking why can Scottish gatekeepers shoot the goose sander? They're, they're uh, curious yes. if it's the diet of, of salmon. I think that's a good one to answer. Yeah, sorry, I didn't go into very much detail about that. Um, so licenses are, are issued um, by Nature Scott, the, um, the statutory nature conservation organisation in, in Scotland, um, to shoot goose sanders as an aid to scaring them away from uh, what are perceived to be particular problem areas where goosanders are feeding on on um, large numbers of fish. Um, so uh, under licensed gamekeepers and gillies are able to shoot limited numbers of birds um, as an aid to scaring. Um, so far, I've had two of my tagged birds um, shot around the tweed. Thank you for answering that. Uh, I'm sorry, I should I, just just very quickly. One of the reasons why we're uh, uh, there's so much interest in this um, sort of work is that um, organisations like Nature Scott are um, under increasing pressure to justify their license um, regimes and the licences that they issue. Um, so, in yeah, that's so that's that's why there's more interest in in goosander uh, tagging and and understanding their movements because they they may be challenges to those licences in the future. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have that background and to help explain. Um, we have a more behavioural question. Did the goosander show feeding site fidelity? Um, yes. It, so part of the analysis that we're, we're doing for this is it's called kernel density uh, estimation. So we're just looking at where the birds are spending most of their time on you know which stretches of rivers. 
Um, we did find that on, on the River Tweed, um, there are certain places which are favoured. These are usually around weirs. So that's where the fish are, are, are basically um, slowed down. Um, there's a bit more of a barrier to them. Um, so the, those are favoured feeding areas. The birds in the river um, caught the River Devon at Canvas, even the birds which, which travelled quite far distances, did return to the weir at Canvas, um, uh, you know, within the uh, the time frame that we were tracking them. So there are definite places that they've got in their minds that they, they like to go to feed. Cool. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for just one more question. And the most popular one at the moment seems to be, did your goosanders roost on the river in winter or do they use reservoirs or locks? Well, unfortunately, because the tracking data is only um, for a, a short period of time um, through uh, from. So I was I was tracking from February through till May. Um, I, I wasn't really able to see where they were roosting through the through the whole of the winter. I am hoping to get some more tracking data this year, which might shed some light on, on what they do out with the salmon smolt run. Generally, uh, birds tended to roost just um, at, on on the uh, the sides of the the larger rivers. So on the Tweed, they would be nesting on uh, so roosting on um, shingle banks. Um, I didn't actually track them very often uh, roosting on still waters. Um, I can count on one hand how many times uh, birds were roosting on on those locations, other than the birds that which spent most of the time at Loch Leven. That was a juvenile bird that just did burleys around around the loch. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, I think we've probably just reached the end of the first session, so I'd like to say thank you very much, Anthony, for a brilliant talk. It's really great. And um, people who do have questions, Anthony is on Twitter, as you can see, and available via email. If you'd like to ask him these extra questions, please do get in touch with him. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any further questions. So we're moving on to our next talk. This is going to be presented by Ros Green. Ros is going to give us an update on her shell duck migration, which she's looking at in response to offshore wind farms. So if she's all ready, I will let her take over. Thank you very much, Ros. Thanks, Catherine. Can you hear and see me OK and see the presentation now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Ros Green. I was a full time research ecologist in the wetland and marine team until last July when I started a PhD studying the migration of shell duck in relation to offshore wind farms. Um, some of you might have joined the conference in 2020 where I gave an uh, update on our initial pilot work and that has now expanded into this PhD project. So I'll give you a bit of an oversight of where we've got to um, since 2019. So to start with, um, this is the distribution of our shell duck population. It's the Northwest European population, which is one of five across um, northern latitudes of Europe and Asia. Um, mostly shell duck breed in coastal areas, in holes um, such as rabbit holes or under sheds or in haystacks and things like that. Um, but the population is increasing and thus has expanded inland quite a bit. And um, as recently as the 1990s, it expanded into Iceland as well. And as you can see from this map, they breed um, all around the coast in this area. But in the winter, the birds that are in the north and the east tend to move south and west um, to look for more favourable climate, so away from cold regions. Uh, and that population in Iceland, we're not really sure where they go in winter, but most likely it's to the UK. And, they, and, and so as you can see, these uh, movements will have to force them to cross the sea at some point, especially when the, um, they come to the UK, where we host internationally important numbers of shell duck in the winter. But as they have to cross the sea, they may well come into contact with offshore wind farms, um, which we currently have about 40 operational offshore wind farms in UK waters. That's the, the tiny green and orange polygons here, um, which do produce about 11 gigawatts of our energy, which uh, in the beginning of the year 2020 was about a third of our household energy demands. So it's a fairly significant um, quantity of our energy needs now but the government has a target to increase this to about 50 gigawatts by 2030 so within eight years a lot of these other polygons the yellows blues and purples will be filled um, or will will have some sort of development within them um, and also all the other countries neighboring the north sea 
Irish and Celtic seas are have similar targets. So um, the North Sea particularly will be seeing a lot of development in the next eight to 20 years, probably. Um, so inevitably, any bird crossing these seas is going to have an increasing chance of interacting with any of these offshore wind farms. Um, but shell duck don't just move between the breeding and non-breeding areas. They're also um, better known for their molt migration. So as Anthony has just shown, goosander do this, but shell duck are the other best known species for a molt migration. So after they finish molting, uh, breeding, sorry, in June, between June and August, they'll migrate to one of these molting grounds. The largest known one is the Heligoland Blight in Germany um, and the Dutch Wadden Sea also but hold about 250,000 birds in August. But any of these other sites, especially in the UK, can hold about five to 15,000 molting shell duck uh, in August and September. Um, so birds from our distribution, uh, from the UK and this Northwest European distribution, have to fly from a breeding ground to one of these sites and then on to a non-breeding site and then probably back to a breeding site, all of which can cause them to cross the sea and interact with us these offshore wind farms. But currently we don't really know um, how, uh, how they might interact with offshore wind farms on these migrations and what the scale of those interactions might be. So that's the purpose of my PhD, is to try and understand those knowledge gaps. I'll give you an oversight of the entire PhD um, and then tell you what I'll be focusing on in this talk specifically. So the first aim will be to do a vulnerability assessment of migratory anatidae um, in, in total. So that's ducks, swans, geese and sawbills like the goosander that Anthony was just talking about to see which of species within that group are most likely to interact with offshore wind farms and potentially what um, the scale of those interactions will be, uh, particularly highlighting any knowledge gaps and data gaps for that group that may need to be filled by other projects such as Anthony's. Uh, tagging work and my shell duck tagging work and uh, yeah as I've just said the second uh, key chapter will be a multi-year tracking study to look at the molt site utilization and movement patterns across those sea areas um, collecting key uh, data on the flight um, the height and speeds and timings of that so, so to feed into collision risk models for offshore wind farms uh, third chapter will be to look at the connectivity between the molting and the non-breeding sites. Like, like Anthony, with the tracking work, I'm constrained to short-term tagging methods that can only track the movements between breeding and molting areas. So I need to use a different method to look at the movements between molting and non-breeding sites. Um, so that'll be stable isotope analysis. Then I'll move on to looking at what proportion of the population might interact with offshore wind farms using lots of BTOs monitoring data sets. So if you've ever submitted data for shell duck during the year, I'll probably be using that within the PhD. And finally, I'll bring all that together to try and understand what the impact um, of, of all of um, these things will be on uh, shell duck and the offshore wind farms and maybe broaden that out to an day in general mostly to help offshore wind farm companies reduce their risk to, to this species group. But today I'll just focus on um, chapters two and three. So as I said, the tracking study, I did cover this in the 2020 BTO conference. Um, we did an initial pilot study um, tracking four birds from Suffolk to uh, the Dutch Wadden Sea in 2019 which showed that it was possible to tag this species at the right time of year and collect the data we needed. Um, the tags, which are very similar to what Anthony was using on his goosander, collected high resolution data on the routes. Um, here you can see that we did record offshore wind farm interactions with both operational and planned wind farm sites, collected data on the timings, the flight heights, speed, and some accelerometry data that helps us look at energetics of, of that. Um, flight. These are some of the graphs, but I won't go into detail because um, we wrote these up in two BTO reports and a paper, uh, which are all available on the BTO website and um, my website, which I'll give you a link to at the end. Um, but essentially, this shows that shell duck do interact with offshore wind farms and may be at risk of collision with them. So we then expanded that work. Um, so in 2021, uh, we 
tracked at uh, Martinmere and a further sample from Havergate where we did the 2019 sample. I did 10, 10 extra birds from Havergate, 15 birds from Martinmere. And we tagged these earlier in the season than that 2019 sample. The 2019 sample was in uh, mid-July, which is quite late in the molting period. But we did in 2021, we um, aimed for a sample much earlier in the, the malt period. So 15th of June, mid-June is when they are said to begin that migration. So we're trying to expand the temporal scale of this project with this later sample. And in 2022, we followed that with 10 birds in Strangford Lock and 10 birds in the Tees Estuary. Uh, and again, earlier in that uh, migratory cycle. Um, so as you can see, we, we got a much better geographic representation of the population um, within the UK. Uh, and then that all went very well. And here are the tracks um, again with, as with Anthony's tags, these are short term deployments. They don't stay on very long because they're super glued and um, the birds are going off to molt. So they actually just molt the, the tags off during their, um, during their body molt. Um, that coincides with this uh, malt migration. So this is only about a month or two's data from each bird. As you can see, the, the Havergate sample did very similar things to what, what the 2019 sample did. Um, and the Martin Mir sample was very interesting in that they didn't fly across the sea or very far. They only moved about 50 kilometers down into the Mersey and the Dee. Um, but due to this short-term tagging method, and the fact that I tagged all of these birds on the 15th of June, they had all shed their tags by the by mid-July, which is actually um, still quite early for um, birds from this side of the country. So for instance, the Strangford Lock birds, quite a lot of those left Strangford after the 15th of July. So it's quite possible that some of these Martin Mere birds did then carry on east, um, but due to the tagging constraints, we, we can't be certain of that. Um, as you can see, the Strangford lockbirds, most of them, well, all of them left um, Northern Ireland. Some of them only moved to Morecambe Bay. Most of them went to the Humber Estuary. And then uh, a few of them moved on to the Wadden Sea. So we've got a good range of data from those. And then the Tees Estuary birds uh, mostly went to the Humber, but also to the Wadden Sea. And these two red tracks are um, very exciting for me because uh, brilliantly, some of these tags managed to stay on for longer than expected, made it through the malt in the Humber. And then uh, this one bird went straight back to the Tees Estuary. It was an immature male, so it was quite um, nice to have data from his very first malt migration, completing an entire cycle or entire movement back to the Tees. And then the other was an adult female that went all the way to Morecambe Bay. Um, so again, great to have some of that post malt migration, especially the female, which shows that they're using quite a few different sites. Um, presumably she will cross back to the tees before the breeding season. Uh, but again, because the tags fall off quite early, we can't be sure of that. Um, so just to zoom in on some of those tracks, uh, pop back this, this bird from Havergate um, sent took off in quite a northerly direction, missed the Wadden Sea, and ended up at this cluster of German wind farms over here. Um, he stopped on the sea for a bit, so as Anthony just mentioned, they do have that option, given this, um, and after they do have that option that they can just sit on the sea if they get tired. Uh, I don't know if this bird was tired or just needed to get its bearings for a bit, but sat on the sea for a bit. And then instead of turning right to the Wadden Sea, it turned left and north and did a scenic tour of all of these wind farms um, and then carried on to the German Wadden Sea. Um, and then uh, another individual that I tracked from the Tees. Here you can see uh, each point is one minute apart and it went round one wind farm over the top of another through an area that's currently at the planning phase. Um, of development around another wind farm. Um, so this just shows that these birds are interacting with wind farms in, in several different um, countries and scales. Um, yeah, so uh, just to summarize all of that, of the 49 birds I've tracked, 30 of them have crossed the sea. Um, 
So as you saw, some of the martinmere birds just skirted down the coast, some of the teas birds just skirted down the coast. But 30 of them have, have made a proper sea crossing. Uh, of those, um, or, or between those, they've interacted with 20 operational wind farms. So that's coming within 2.5 kilometres of the wind farm um, or within the wind farm and 24 sites that are planned. Um, and that's in three countries. So there's sufficient evidence here to show that shell duck and our population are interacting with offshore wind farms and that that's likely to increase uh, in the future as more and more are developed in the North Sea. Um, so the outcomes so far, as I say, they can definitely interact with offshore wind farms. There is significant uh, increase in construction in their migratory routes, which for at least the populations I've tracked, we now know where these routes are and where, where the major corridors for this migration happen. Um, again, the, they are interacting with wind farms from multiple countries. So in order to protect the population going forward, there needs to be collaboration between these different governments in, in how many wind farms they put in these migratory routes. But there's still more to learn. Uh, inevitably. I'm only collecting data for the outbound migration. I don't know what routes they're taking on their way back to the UK uh, or what the population that breed in the continent do when they come to the UK for the winter, whether they're taking similar routes or, or doing something slightly different. So my next steps for tracking, I retrieved 11 of the deployed tags this year, so we'll track um, 11 more from another site next year. I'm currently looking for sites in Scotland. So if anyone knows of a great place for 11 shell duck in June next year in Scotland, that would be great. Um, and uh, trying to develop long-term deployment methods, as Anthony mentioned, um, it's great to try and get extra tracking data for longer periods. Um, and as I said, I'm not getting that migration back from the, the molting grounds to the non-breeding areas. So I intend to utilize a stable isotope analysis to look at that. Um, so this year, some of you may have seen that we put out um, a media ask to collect shell duck feathers from these molt sites around the UK and uh, the Wadden Sea. Um, this went pretty well, but um, it turns out it's quite difficult to get down to the muddy tide lines. So people, uh, including myself, did go to lots of muddy tide lines, found these molted feathers that had washed to the shore, picked them up, posted them to me, and we instantly updated this map. So the DS tree is now a, a known mulch site for the shell duck. It had been um, thought that this was a mulch site previously, but never been confirmed. So we've now confirmed that that is a mulch site with several thousand shell duck in August. Uh, and I found some feathers in Iceland that suggests that that population might molt up there before they come to us for the winter rather than coming to us to molt. Um, so that was very useful. Didn't manage to get feathers from the Firth of Forth, the Danish Warden Sea or the Schult Estuary, um, but I did manage to get feathers from all of these other sites. So in total, I now have 168 feathers to do stable isotope analysis on. You're probably wondering what on earth stable isotope analysis is. So uh, feathers hold a chemical signature of carbon and nitrogen uh, within them once they've been grown. And that the ratio of those uh, two isotopes can hopefully tell us where that feather was grown. So here you can see a map for jellyfish that was produced, where on the left um, there's a scale of, of carbon, the concentration of this carbon element. Um, and the feathers varies across that uh, Northwest European distribution. And on the right, the nitrogen varies. And the ratio of those two elements um, hopefully will produce something like this map on the bottom right. This is my current working hypothesis. Inevitably, it won't be so neat when I actually analyze the feathers. Um, but hopefully at the very least, I will be able to tell whether a feather was grown on the continent or in the UK, and maybe within the UK, whether it was grown on the east or the west coast or up in Scotland. Um, if that's the case and I can get a nice clustering pattern like this when I analyse the carbon nitrogen isotope concentration within the feathers, I should then be able to um, collect feathers from birds in non-breeding sites. 
So here on the right, you see a map of the uh, special protection areas for shell duck. I intend to collect feathers from birds using those sites in the non-breeding season and then analyse their stable isotope content to see where those feathers were grown. And hopefully this will allow me to establish the connectivity between those non-breeding sites and the molting sites and therefore whether they've had to cross a sea, um, either of the seas, to uh, move between those areas. And it'll also give me an idea of what level of mixing there is within the non-breeding site. So whether all birds from one non-breeding site have molted at the same place or whether they all come from different places, which will give us a, a level, an understanding of the, um, the level of connectivity for the whole population between all of these sites and whether the whole population is at risk of offshore wind farm interactions or whether it's just sub sections of the, the overall population. Um, so to summarise, again, this is all confirming that they do interact with offshore wind farms. Uh, there was insufficient data to understand the scale of this interaction before 2019 when we started this work, uh, but the GPS tracking data is filling some of those data gaps and uh, absolutely proving that the scale of interaction uh, warrants further research. And I'll be using other techniques to fill in those other data gaps. Um, if I can't do long-term GPS tracking, there are other methods I can use to try and um, ensure that offshore wind farm companies know what the risks to this population are. Um, the next steps, as I say, is obviously to analyze GPS data further, really look at what flights, what um, heights and speeds they're flying as they cross the sea and whether they're um, at, like, at risk of either direct collision or protect, potentially energetic consequences from having to fly around or over lots and lots of wind farms on each migration. I'll conduct the stable isotope analysis. Now I've got those 168 feathers, uh, some of which I was just sorting out just before this talk. Um, I'll, I'll analyse those properly in the spring, hopefully, and see if I can build up that ice escape um, for the species. And then eventually I'll build a picture for the whole population to understand what this level of interaction will be. Um, I should acknowledge our funders, both uh, the BTO and um, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy are funding my PhD now, which is supervised by John and Rachel at Liverpool and Sam, who's speaking next, um, and Angus, my other supervisor at BTO. Um, thanks to all of these people for contract support and research advice, particularly particularly Neil Burton, who's head of the Wetland and Marine uh, Research Team at the BTO, um, who set up a lot of this, uh, made, it, made it possible to do the PhD, and all the field workers who have collected any form of data for me thus far, including anyone who submits shell duck sightings to any one of the BTO data sets. Um, they're all listed on my uh, website, people who have directly contributed to the PhD so far. Thank you. If you want to follow the PhD, you can do so directly on my website or through the BTO website where they'll be putting updates um, every now and again. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Ros. That's really nice. Great to hear. And you'll be pleased to know you have 15 questions already. People are really Lightning. keen to know your <laughs> answers. Um, That's great. Uh, I think we, we've got loads of upvotes, so I think I'm going to start at the top if you're okay with that. Yeah. So fine. the most popular one at the moment is asking, is it possible to tell what sort of wind conditions the birds favour for their migrations? And can you see how that matches up with how the wind farms are being operated? That's definitely something I'll be looking at in detail for the PhD, but generally they're flying in tailwinds. So like Anthony mentioned with the goosander, um, that was flying in a tailwind. So if they pick a a very fast tailwind, they can obviously cover the distance in a, a lot shorter time. Um, so it might be that Antony's goosander flying at 64 miles per hour could well have had a 20 mile per hour tailwind pushing it along um, at speed, which would mean that it gets through any wind farm much faster, which is potentially good, um, is less likely to collide with them, um, but equally does mean at those wind speeds, the turbines will be rotating going fast if they travel in flat wind speeds um, that aren't turning the, the wind farms around they're much less likely to uh, interact with the blade um, so it's definitely something I'll be looking into the PhD cool and, yeah, gen generally shell duck flying in tailwinds as well 
there's a related question as well. Do you know what height the birds migrate at? Yeah, so I skipped through it in, in um, that slide about the 2019 data, but generally they're flying between 30 metres above sea level and about 200 metres above sea level, which coincides almost exactly with the height of wind farm uh, turbines at the moment there. The blades at the moment for the larger wind farms that are going in now are between about 25 metres above sea level and about 250 metres above sea level, uh, rising uh, they're developing turbines that are 300 metres above sea level now. So it's uh, they're getting ever larger, but shell ducks seem to be flying at exactly the, the wrong height to avoid uh, interactions with turbines. Yeah, no, no, that's understandable. Um, there is a couple more upvotes, but one that does relate to this. People, someone wanted to know, does shell duck migrate in large numbers or flocks? Again, an excellent question um, and one that I have been looking into as best I can. It seems they're going in small numbers. So unlike, say, pink-footed geese or hooper swans and things that are in this Anatidae family as well, it seems they're flying either singly or in very small groups, maybe up to about five birds. Um, each of the samples I've tagged have been caught simultaneously at a roost site. So they, they look like a coherent flock, but no, no birds out of any of my samples have migrated together. Um, so they're, they're definitely going independently of the birds that they were with at one point. Nobody's seeing them going, but uh, inevitably it's um, because how, of how birded the East Coast is, for sure. If there were large flocks of shell duck leaving together, people would report them and nobody does. People just see ones and twos going off. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it makes could make quite a difference to the collision risk modelling because skeins of birds uh, are more likely to, in, to collide with turbines than single birds. Yeah. And talking about turbines, there's quite a few questions on them as well. And the current one that's sitting at the top is, have there been any studies on visible or audible alarms on wind turbines to try and scare birds away from rotating blades? There's a lot of research on mitigation methods or ways of reducing collision um, in terms of visual systems on on onshore turbines now there's quite a weight of evidence that making one of the three blades black can reduce the risk of collision because it makes the whole rotor swept area look more obvious um because there's a two thirds of it is white and one third of it is black so it's just more evident for them to avoid um not sure about auditory systems necessarily, but the turbines themselves make a bit of noise. Um, but it's uh, hard to know how well birds um, react to that. Most turbines also have lights on. So one thing I didn't mention is that most of these shell duck are flying at night. Um, so any turbine with a light on will be evident to them. I have a small suspicion that that bird that flew far north to that cluster of German wind farms was actually attracted by lights in sea fog. Um, I have no real evidence for that, but the conditions were correct for sea fog. Um, and, and I think um, it may have mistaken that cluster of wind farms for the north coast of uh, the Netherlands, um, just, just because of how direct its flight was to that cluster. Um, so that there's definitely research into it. But it's very hard to um, assess how successful any of those methods are offshore because it's such a challenging environment to do any survey work in. It's hard enough to um, look at the impact of those methods on onshore wind farms. Um, so, yeah, the offshore environment is a whole other ball game, really. Yeah, definitely. It's when you wish you could have a camera on the back, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, someone does ask the question, have there been any wind turbine casualties? And I guess you don't know about that yet. Um, of the birds that have migrated that I've got data for, and these are GSM tags, so they're, um, they're transmitting their data uh, once a day. Um, and even if uh, they've fallen off the bird and floated around on the tide line, I'm picking some of them up a month after they've been floating around on the North Sea. Um, so from all of the tags I've got data, um, to the point of retrieval or, or post malt, and none of them have interacted, have, have had a casualty with offshore wind farms, even ones that have flown straight through. Um, so, although I'm talking about 
risk of collision. I, I currently feel that the risk of collision for shell duck is very low. Um, it's and low. likely for a lot of the other the duck species as well. Um, and sort of on, a, on another note about sort of things that could impact your work, will avian influenza reflect your work? Someone's asking, it's quite topical at the moment, I guess. Yeah, it's very topical. Um, so it doesn't seem to affect shell duck very much. Um, they're, they're very rarely found in these sort of mass mortality events that are happening at the moment. Um, one thing it has impacted already is the, uh, I said I was trying to develop a long-term tagging method. I was gonna do a captive trial at Martin Mir uh this this winter i was meant to be doing that now but because martin me has been locked down by ai um i can't do that so it's it's impacting in that sort of way but um i don't think it's going to impact shell duck very much there's very little evidence that this current strain is having a, a major impact on them they seem to have quite decent immunity to avian influenza strains um probably because they're mixing so much around this distribution already they've, they've got quite good immunity compared to seabirds, which tend to have quite in a new, naive immune system to these strains because they're not interacting with the birds that are spreading them very much. Cool. Um, we've probably got time for just one more question and the rest of them, I'm sure you'll happily see if you can answer them in the, the chat function. Yep. Uh, so the Q&A function, there will be options. Um, yep. Do your tags give height data so that one can tell whether the birds fly above turbines or at the height where they might collide? So kind of linking it up again. Yes, yeah, they do. It's GPS altitude data, which um, isn't as accurate as we would like necessarily, but it's still very informative. Um, and uh, I, to the point where I can see at least whether they're climbing up and over wind farms or flying through them. So um, one of those examples I gave of the high resolution data going through wind farms, it, it went round one wind farm between you know, at sort of turbine height. Um, certainly below the top of the wind farm, went then climbed quite significantly and went over the top of the next wind farm and then certainly dropped down. So it was probably still over the top of the next wind farm, but potentially just at the, the maximal height of that wind farm. So yes, I, I am collecting height data um, that, that can answer that question. Oh, fantastic. So sadly, that's going to be the end. Um, there are still more questions coming in. So you've obviously been highly popular. So <laughs> please I'll do have a go. As many as I can. <laughs> thank you very much for a lovely talk. And if anyone has any further questions for Roz, please do email her, look at her website, and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer those as well on Twitter too, as there are many different mediums. But thank you again, Roz. And we're moving to our third and final talk of the session. It's going to be Sam Franks is presenting this, and she's talking about Curlew and her talk, Giving Curlew a Head Start. So if she's all ready to go. Off you go, Sam. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. Can you hear and see me all right on my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, for those of you who attended last year, you will think you are seeing a repeat of the 2021 conference. I assure you, you are not. Um, this is going to provide an update on how the work has progressed that I reported on last year, how it's progressed uh, in this new year, because there are some new and exciting results to report. But for those of you who did attend last year, sit back and relax because the first couple of slides will be for the benefit of those of you who don't know as much about the background of Curlew in the UK and the reasons why we're doing head starting and what even head starting is. So just to recap, uh, BTO's long-term monitoring data, both our breeding bird trend data and our atlas data, indicate that the UK's curly population has declined rapidly over the last several decades, as I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And there's plenty of information to suggest that this poor breeding success, uh, it's poor breeding success that is the reason behind declines. So adult survival, we know, is relatively high, um, but it's the failure at both the nest and the chick stage which is driving population decline. And there's various conservation interventions that are being employed around the country to try and mitigate uh, against this poor breeding success, including improving habitat, um, fencing uh, around nests to prevent their losses either from mammalian nest predators or from agricultural operations and predator control, to name just a few. But the one that we're going to examine more closely in this talk is head starting. Now, what is head starting? Well, in the context of this project and many other bird related head starting projects, it's taking eggs out of the wild at the, the nest stage and then rearing them and hatching the chicks in captivity, rearing those chicks 
and then when they are full grown, releasing them back into the wild. So why might you want a head start? Well, if you consider on the left a wild uh, clutch of four eggs, you might expect under current circumstances for those four eggs to produce 0.2 to 0.3 fledglings per pair per year, which is about half the number of fledglings needed to be produced per year to maintain a stable wild population of curlews. If, on the other hand, you take those four eggs into captivity and head start them, you can turn those into approximately 3.2 fledglings per pair per year, which is a huge potential annual increase in productivity and might get close to um, A, turning the declines around and really actually putting many of our potential um, very um, isolated and declining uh, populations, particularly in the lowlands, on a significant upward trajectory. So when might you want to head start? Well, this is a, a little bit of sort of example, um, sort of back of the envelope modeling work done by Jeff Hilton at Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust to demonstrate a couple of different scenarios. In the first scenario, you have a population of breeding birds that starts off at the beginning of your study at about 40 individuals and undergoes a gradual decline over time. If you undertake head starting for a period of five years during the period shown in yellow here, you can boost your population back up to a significant uh, 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 kind of its starting level, which buys you time to implement other types of interventions that might help to uh, recover and stabilize your population. So this is the buying time scenario. In the second scenario, you have a very small native population of maybe five or six individuals, something like that, that's gradually just ticking along um, just, above, uh, just above stability. So very, very slowly increasing. In this situation, you might undertake your head starting again for the five years shown in yellow, and this will then boost your population size up <clears throat> to a much more significant level of 40 individuals making it much more resilient to stochastic random events that might lead to local extinction. So this is the kind of kickstarting small population scenario. There are currently five head starting projects ongoing in the UK. For those of you who were here last year, Sussex um, is the new project um, underway this year, being undertaken as a translocation to an area which doesn't currently have a native breeding population of curlew. Each of these projects has very much their own rationale for doing head starting, but I'm going to focus uh, in this case only on <clears throat> the project that BTO is involved with over here in Norfolk. And this is a large partnership project with many participants led by um, the government agency Natural England. So in East Anglia, Airfields, and particularly military airfields, provide really ideal curly breeding habitat in what is largely otherwise a very arable landscape. However, um, curlews, being very large birds, quite attracted to grassland as well, um, they pose quite a significant risk to uh, military aircraft. And so historically, many, um, particularly RAF airfields, have uh, requested a license from Natural England to destroy eggs for flight safety reasons. However, Head starting does now present uh, a viable um, conservation alternative to egg destruction, with young birds being able to be released back into small and very isolated populations. And so in 2019, Natural England, in partnership with the RAF and with Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, who had done head starting with two other wader species previously, they trialed the removal of eggs from five um, airfields in eastern England, brought those into captivity at WWT Slimbridge in Gloucestershire. And then those uh, resulting 50 chicks were then released into uh, the local Gloucestershire population in the Severn and Avon Vale. Now, some of those birds, uh, three years on from the project, have uh, started to return to breed in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire and nearby sites in the Thames Valley, suggesting that it is um, possible, or again, the first indications that head starting might be a potential viable um, conservation tool for small local curly populations. But we still have much to learn, as you will hear about further. So in 2021, Natural England um, turned their attention to instead transporting these chicks, um, these eggs across the country to Gloucestershire, returning them into the local um, East Anglian population in Norfolk. So the Norfolk Head Starting Project extends the study area that BTO is currently working in around Brecklin northwards. So um, you might have seen a talk by my PhD student, Harry Ewing, who's just finishing up his work now. He's at the University of East Anglia 
So he's working in Breckland where there are about 150 pairs of breeding birds. And the Head Starting Project um, extends this um, study area northwards into um, West Norfolk, where there is a very, very small population of between probably two and five um, breeding curlew pairs currently. This map in the bottom left shows the proposed release location bordering the east shore of the Wash. The blue circle here shows the current existing local cur curlew population. If we uh, blow that map up to show a more zoomed in um, version of it, uh, you can see where our two different release sites are. We have one release site right against the east shore of the Wash at Wild Can Hill, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, and then one quite a bit about 15, 20, um, 15 kilometers further inland at the Sandringham estate. This is a different site than we used last year for Sandringham for reasons that I will go into um, shortly. So over the past two years, eggs have been collected from airfields by Natural England and WWT staff. They're taken into captivity and put into incubators until hatch, and they're looked, up, um, looked after very carefully by specialist aviculturists. And the chicks are then raised indoors under heat lamps for about a week before they're transferred to an outdoor aviary, like you see here. And they're in that outdoor aviary for about, three, about four weeks until they're able to fly. So in 2021, we were able to collect 106 eggs. It kind of far exceeded um, expectations because we had a few new airfields which um, joined in the study. Unfortunately, in 2022, the number of eggs that we got from airfields um, was cut back significantly to only 58. Now there's two potential reasons for this, and we don't know exactly what is the cause, whether it is the result of curlew pairs on these different airfields producing fewer eggs or fewer pairs returning to uh, fewer pairs returning to breed. Um, but there was also at the same time a change in the bird control contractors who um, had the contract to um, identify eggs um, and who sort of patrol all of these airfields um, looking for curly pairs. There was a change in those contractors between 2021 and 22, so it could be that the, the newer contractors are perhaps just less experienced at, um, at finding curly nests and identifying breeding behavior. We don't really know. Uh, and so 2023 will very much be a litmus test of, you know, how viable the project is to continue, continue in terms of how many eggs we're able to get. So once birds are able to fly, um, they're then moved into these flight pens at Pensthorpe until they're about 50 days old, at which point they're transferred to their release site. So when they're moved into these flight pens, that is when BTO really uh, first gets involved with the project in a given year. We come along and we bring and measure the chicks. We attach the um, color marks, the flag um, that you can see on the leg of this chick in the foreground. And then uh, here is our lovely host, Catherine, in the back of uh, the BTO truck, um, moving boxes, individually boxed up curlews um, from Penchthorpe, uh, about 30 to 40 minutes down the road to their release sites at Ken Hill and Sandringham. So we have these two um, these two different release sites, and they're quite different in terms of the habitat, and that was quite on purpose. So the first is the Wildcan Hill site, which is a wet grass and release site. This is what um, it looked like just outside the release pen in 2021. As you might imagine, given the, um, the extreme drought we had here in East Anglia, it very much did not look like this year. Uh, in 2022, um, it was incredibly dry. The vegetation was, as a result, very, very short. That lovely wet pool that you saw right outside the release pen, we thought in 2021, oh, beautiful. This provides great habitat for chicks to be released into. Not so much in 2022. It was absolutely dry as a bone from the day that the first chicks were transferred to Wildcan Hill. And um, quite worryingly for the whole project team, um, the day before the first cohort of birds was due to be released from Ken Hill, um, this happened to coincide with that incredible hot spell where it was 38, 39 degrees um, in this part of Norfolk. And as many of you probably saw either in the news or perhaps on social media, Wild Ken Hill has a quite, had a quite significant um, wildfire in the, the coastal park bordering Snetisham Beach. Um, this had all of our hearts in our mouths, but fortunately um, the amazing fire crews and the staff at Wildcan Hill were able to contain the fire so that it didn't kind of um, cross uh, landward of the inner sea wall to the area where the release pen is. So here in the foreground, you can see the burned coastal park and the arrow in the background shows the release pen only about probably 500 meters away from the closest burn area. So we we're very fortunate. 
um, that the flyer did not get close to release pen because that would have been really devastating for our first cohort of birds. So that's the kind of um, coastal wet grassland site. We then um, designed it to have an arable release site as well. And this is to largely mimic the type of habitat that breeding curly um, use in and around Breckland, where there's small patches of grassland interspersed um, in a more arable dominated landscape. This is um, a picture of the location on Sandringham Estate from 2021. And I mentioned we moved um, that this year. This was almost too arable. There was um, the pen, uh, the release pen field, which was kind of the, the only really suitable habitat with some quite highly arable landscape surrounding. And we wanted something that provided a, a little bit more of a habitat mosaic this year. And so we went looking for a new site. So this was the, the site in 2021. And then we moved further inland, um, east towards Fakenham for 2022, finding this really lovely area of um, what was in fact countryside stewardship agro-environment wildflower option. Um, the, there's quite a number of fields in this countryside stewardship wildflower option for the next five years in and around our new site. And so we feel that this will provide a really quite suitable habitat um, for potential returning birds to recruit and breed in, although it is embedded within a, an arable landscape. So this is uh, our new Sandringham site. So once birds are transferred to the release site, a subset of those are tagged um, by BTO staff, either with a radio tag, like on the left, which is glue mounted, very similarly to Anthony and, and Ros's um, GPS tags. And then on the right, um, another subset of birds were GPS tagged. Unfortunately for waders, we're able to use, and especially for curly, um, we're able to use uh, a, what's called a leg loop harness to have a slightly longer lasting tag attachment method than um, using simply the, the glue mounted tags. These um, leg loop harnesses and GPS tags should stay on for anywhere between nine and 18 months, we hope. And so it can provide quite a, a good indication of um, how birds do and move around the landscape in their first year or so of life. So just a little film about um, how we do the tagging. Catherine's hands in quite a lot of the, the bits um, with the tagging and she was a very great um, uh, sort of colleague to have on the project. So what have we found so far? Well, in 2021, out of the 106 eggs that we were able to collect, we released 79 individuals um, split between Sandringham and Ken Hill, with the majority being released at Ken Hill. In 2022, because of the fewer number of eggs that we were able to receive from um, the various airfields, we only were able to release 37 individuals with um, two different release cohorts at Sandringham and three release releases at Ken Hill between July and August. Now, as you saw, um, all of the birds are color marked with this um, very um, specific scheme with a yellow flag uh, um, over the top of an orange ring on the left leg and a yellow ring on the right leg. And this combination denotes uh, the birds specifically as coming from the Eastern England Head Starting Project. And thank you to um, 
any of you who are watching this who were able to see any of these birds in the field and submit sightings on our web form. We've had obviously the, the east shore of the wash, um, Snetisham, Heacham and Hunstanton is incredibly well birded by bird watchers and so there's quite a number of people um, who are either keen photographers or um, birders who have submitted recitings of these colour marked individuals, which is incredibly valuable data. The colour marking has shown that 28 individuals from 2021 have been seen post-release as of um, yesterday, but only 11 of those have been seen in 2022. So um, a fairly small percentage have been seen since January this year. Most of those have been seen around the wash, but we had one bird which um, has been seen as far afield as the X estuary in Devon. Um, but the wash is a really big place. And so, as you can see, most of our sightings are on the east shore of the wash and looking for color marked birds, despite the fact that the east shore is very well birded, is a bit like searching for a needle in a haystack. And so we need a better way of monitoring what happens to birds after they're released, especially given birds can move even further afield, even anywhere in the UK or even Western Europe. So radio tags that um, we attach to a cohort of birds have helped to some degree with this, and they've been particularly helpful in telling us about local mortality, leading us to predated birds, predated birds, sorry, in the um, days and immediate weeks following release, and how long birds stay in the local release area. So the general field work would be go to each release site um, every couple of days after birds are released and listen for radio tag frequencies of the birds that had been released so far. So um, here's a uh, our volunteer, Jasmine Canham, who's a BTO youth representative and um, doing some radio tracking in the field this summer. And she was a fantastic volunteer to have on the project. So these tags, they're glue mounted. So similarly to Anthony and Rose's tags, they'll fall off after about three to six months once birds molt their back feathers. Um, and one of the most useful factors um, for the radio tags was they're able to lead us like, to unfortunate situations where birds were predated, but otherwise we would probably have never found these individuals. So it was quite useful to tell us something about what the main predators, largely avian predators, are of, curly, of young curlews once they're released. However, both the radio tags and the flags only work by telling you where birds are, where you're looking for them. They don't tell you anything about where birds are in the places where you're not looking. And that's where the GPS tag technology comes in, which provides, um, as for the, uh, the shell duck and the goosanders, a remote way of keeping tab on tabs on bird movements. So these are tags very similar to the ones that Anthony and Roz uses, Ornatella GPS GSM tags. So they take fixes um, on any sort of frequency of schedule that you program, and then they transmit the data over the mobile phone network. This tag weighs about 12 grams, including the harness. And as you saw in the video, birds wear the harness like a little rucksack. So the loops fit around the legs up in the sort of the leg pit or sort of the equivalent of our armpit, much like you or I would wear a rucksack. And the finished product um, is seen on this bird here. So in 2021, this was very much a pilot year to see whether young curly juveniles, which aren't fully grown yet, could take a GPS tag um, effectively. And head started birds were um, uh, great to be able to test this on because we can monitor how they behave and how well they take the tag for about a week because they're still in the release pen before getting released. So we um, attached four tags in 2021, and that went reasonably well. And so in 2022, we're able to increase that to 12 GPS tags. So this was the very first bird, 0E, that we tagged um, in 2021. And it um, fortunately, it was actually retained its tag for over a full year. We lost contact with it um, not too long ago. And so here it was released um, uh, at the Sandringham site on the 6th of July, 2021. It spent much of the autumn near Frampton RSPB on the salt marsh, and then quite a lot of the winter on the south shore of the wash near Gedney, and it was last heard from around here on the 28th of August this year. And condensing uh, a year's worth of movements um, into one point a day in 15 seconds, this is how the bird moved over um, the course of its first year of life before uh, we don't know what happened to this bird, unfortunately, either the tag has run out of battery or it's fallen off or the bird's been predated and we've not been able to recover the tag. So what happened in 2022? Well, we had our 12 GPS tags and the next little animation that I'm going to show you um, is quite amazing, showing you how those 12 birds have um, behaved um, once they were released. So this will start from the 20th of July and run right through until the end of August. So it covers the 
sort of six, um, five different releases, the two at Sandringham and the three at Ken Hill, and the first six weeks um, after the first release. So this shows all the GPS tag birds. And you will notice um, at about the sort of late August mark, if you're watching sharply, there'll be one bird that shoots off the left-hand side of the screen. And we'll come to that one in a moment. So here they are. We have the purpley colored birds over at the Ken Hill site. We've got the sort of bluish teal birds over at the Sandringham site. You can see the Sandringham birds start to explore the landscape. They split up at this point and one ends up at RAF Skullthorpe, going back and forth to um, the North Norfolk coast at Holcombe, where it still is currently. You've got one up near Hunstanton, kind of patrolling the foreshore. And you've got one from Sandringham that kind of stayed quite close to the release pen. And then all the Ken Hill birds have kind of stayed in the vicinity of that uh, wet grassland, kind of popping it every now and again out onto the intertidal. And the other birds from Sandringham are a bit more exploratory. We've had a second release now at Ken Hill, that green bird just shot off to uh, the mouth of the Great Ooze. You can see the purple birds from the first cohort often moving together, which we have found from the tag data, which has been quite interesting. Now, as we get towards the end of August, birds start to move quite a bit more away from the release site. You might have just seen a purple bird shoot off the left hand side of the screen. And so this state of play at the end of um, August is very much similar to what we see now, as we'll see in a moment. So that bird that shot off the left hand side of the screen, this is what happened to it. On the 24th of August, um, it left the wash very rapidly. It started off at its release site. Um, headed west, had all of our hearts in our mouths as it shot um, to the southwest over the Celtic Sea before thinking better of its trajectory and returning to land on the southeast coast of Ireland near Ballyteague. There's another bird which um, decided to migrate in uh, not until um, the middle of September, which hung out for ages um, near uh, a nursing home in Lincolnshire, far from the coast, before deciding it was going to migrate southwest over Cornwall and then turning south to make landfall uh, on the coast of Brittany near Roscoff. So where are these birds now? Well, um, they're pretty much exactly where you saw them make landfall. The, the bird that went to Ireland is very much still there in the southeast corner of Ireland. Um, these are movements um, from the last couple of months, over the last month. And this is the bird on uh, the north coast of Brittany near Roscoff and the Ile de Bas. How about the other birds? Well, one of them has been predated. I have the recovered tag um, here. Um, and we were able to fortunately recover that one again. That was um, probably predated by a raptor on the, the, the Wolferton salt marsh. Uh, two of the birds we have lost contact with, and we're not sure whether that's because the battery died or, um, or because uh, the tag's fallen off um, or the bird has been predated. And the remaining seven, are pretty much exactly where they were at the end of August, beginning of September. So largely scattered around the wash, the one that's still on the uh, the North Norfolk coast, doing going to and from in that same um, inland coastal pattern, presumably following the tidal pattern. But we now know from the tagging data that birds do spread out from the east shore of the wash, often moving over to the south shore and round to the west shore as well, which is why we end up not seeing as many color marked birds on the east shore as we might think we would otherwise. So what next? What are our key questions? Well, some of the key questions that we'd like to get out of this are, are juveniles, um, release juveniles behaving like proper curlews? There's many indications that they are in fact doing so. Is survival on par with wild birds? And that's one of the, the key results that will determine the success of head starting. And fundamentally, this is the really big one, will release birds recruit locally and when will they do so? Because if birds don't recruit locally, that very much changes the dynamic of your um, effectiveness of head starting as a conservation strategy. If birds aren't going to recruit lo locally to bolster small and isolated and otherwise declining curly populations, then perhaps your resources might be better spent elsewhere. And so in spring 2023, we're going to start getting a first indication of whether or not um, release birds from 2021 are going to recruit locally. Birds do not um, start usually breeding until their second year um, for curlews and beyond. And so the next couple of years of the project will very much determine whether or not we start seeing 
birds recruiting into the, the sort of zone around the release area. But there's so many other questions um, and particularly the tracking data spurned a lot of these. So uh, one of the things that we're uh, hoping to look at in a collaboration with a postdoc at Liverpool John Moores University is looking at how individual personality and cognitive traits relate to post-release behavior and how uh, successfully birds are able to explore a novel landscape. Do birds associate with their friends post-release? You might have spotted some of those tracks of tagged birds, in fact, moving around together, suggesting that they do, in fact, move with uh, others in their cohort. And then what habitats do birds use post-release? And so this was um, some work done last year on the tagged birds by my colleague, Gary Cluley, looking at how habitat use changes in the weeks post-release. So when a bird, this is the zero E, the one um, you saw that was wearing its tag for a full year, they start off being, um, despite the amount of coastal habitat, intertidal habitat available to them, they don't use as much as you might think they do. So the light gray bars show what's available and the black bars show what they use relative to what's available. So they don't use very much at all of the coastal habitat, whereas they much prefer to use grassland compared to the small amount that is available. And if you look at how that habitat selection preference changes over time, six weeks post-release, we see the bird much more starting to use and prefer um, coastal intertidal habitat and salt marsh and reducing its uh, selection of grassland habitat over time. There's a lot of interest in head starting curlew in the UK, but it, it really needs to emphasize that it's not a panacea. It's just one tool in the conservation toolbox and one that's largely to buy time to deploy this whole other full suite of conservation measures. And it's incredibly important to have a post-release monitoring plan in place before starting because otherwise, um, you're not going to be able to get an idea of breeding recruitment rates, which are going to be the really kind of vital statistic that will determine whether conservation is a viable conservation strategy or not for curly. So I'd like to thank my colleagues at BTO, um, all of the volunteers who came out to help on the project, of which there were many, the East of England Head Starting Team and the Washwater Research Group, who's submitted many of the recitings of colour marked birds. I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sam. Really great to see that. And yeah, having been part of it, it's lovely to see it all presented in a sort of a, a more final results way than when I'm halfway in the field with my hands trying to glue a tag to a curly. Um, we have time for a couple of questions um, and just let people know that if they've missed uh, getting their question answered, um, Ros and Anthony have been diligently answering them in the answer section. Um, the first question we can ask is, if you remove a clutch to head start, is a second clutch laid in the nest and how often can you repeat the process? Yeah, so often that is the case, especially if you take the first clutch and very early in incubation. And that is the case for on airfields. Um, on airfields, um, second clutches are often collected as well, simply because some nests just simply can't be left because they're in what's called the red zone. So very close to the runway and therefore at most risk for um, aircraft. Um, and so generally, yes, the aim is to take um, clutches as early as possible in incubation to increase the chance that birds relay. Cool. And I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, someone says, it feels as if head starting is the best only to buy time. And I think you mentioned this as well. What other studies are there to explain poor breeding success and lead to changes that can increase this again? That's the million dollar, million dollar, million pound question, I think. Uh, we would all love to know that. And I think some of the, the projects that are going to be underway in the sort of coming years um, are going to very much be looking at exactly this. Are, are there other ways other than head starting that we can increase, um, increase breeding success? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Sadly, we're running a little bit short of time, Sam. So there were some extra questions. You can, if you don't mind having a quick look at them and in case anybody doesn't get to spot the answers before we end this session, please feel free to send Sam an email or a tweet. I'm sure she'll be please happy do. to answer them. Thank you again, Sam. Okay, so that brings us to the close of this session. I really hope you've enjoyed it. It's fantastic to be able to have our speakers talk about all their work in this free session. And I'd like to thank them for their fantastic contributions and to all of you for giving up your time to join us at our virtual conference. As I mentioned at the start, now more than ever, our research relies on your support and there are many ways to support us. Um, many of you are doing great things for us already, whether you're volunteering, but right now also a good way is to help donate to help our vital work. You can donate where the need is greatest by following the link on the stream, which is bto.org forward slash support. 
And I also hope that you might be able to join us for some more talks. Um, our next session is tomorrow with the Witherby Lecture on uh, studying birds in the context of the full annual cycle with Dr. Peter Mara. Um, it's taking place at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and I hope you're able to join us if you can. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us and I hope you have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>